I'm Jay Wolgamuth, uh, Chief Medical Officer at Quest Diagnostics. And we're here today to discuss the underlying reasons why cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer in the United States and still the number one killer of women in the United States. I'm here with Dr. Felice Gersh, who is board certified in integrative medicine, obstetrics, and gynecology. Welcome. Thanks for coming today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jay. I'm so happy to join you and talk about this critically important topic. Let's talk about cardiovascular disease. And uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the U.S. And uh, despite all the efforts and smoking cessation and with lipid treatment, the, uh, unfortunately, it's actually on the rise again. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a misconception out there that, that the, there's not only a lower risk in women, but maybe that it shouldn't even be on the top of the list of what to address with a woman in an annual visit. So tell us a little bit about um, that, that misconception and what really is the risk in women uh, for heart disease. Well, the risk is very real, as you said. In terms of younger women, it is true that there are more fatal heart attacks in men before the age of menopause for women when you compare them to men. But women have many cardiovascular events that can occur in their lives that maybe are precursors to something that could be life-threatening later in life. For example, pregnancy-related complications. We now know that there is a very strong relationship between women who have issues like gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia. Women who experience those complications during pregnancy, later when they transition into the menopause and then the rest of their lives in menopause, they have a substantially increased risk for developing cardiovascular events. Also, the most common endocrine disorder of women, polycystic ovary syndrome, is also a very huge risk for developing hypertension, gestational diabetes if they become pregnant and they often have fertility problems, diabetes, like a five-fold increased risk by the time they're 40 compared to the general population. And we all know what a huge risk diabetes is for cardiovascular events. And also autoimmune diseases, an area that has been really overlooked as an underlying risk factor for cardiovascular events, particularly as women get older. And older meaning in the 50s and 60s. So we're not talking about like 80s and 90s. So women have substantially increased risk when they have these problems during the reproductive years. And all women have substantially increased risk as they transition through the transition into menopause, those right. several years, and then the menopausal years, which can be up to one half of a woman's life, but not if they don't have proper care because right. women die much more than men do from their first heart attack. So it's really very critical that it's recognized by general population and by medical professionals that women have a very substantial risk of having cardiovascular events during the transition into menopause and the menopausal years and the risk factors that are really glaring if we just recognize them of the events that occur in the health of the woman during the reproductive years that set the stage for the problems after menopause. They've actually shown women during the menopausal transition years, which can go several years before menopause, well, age 45, they're already in there in that range. They already develop atherosclerosis at a higher rate or carotid intima media thickness changing. So inflammation within the arteries is already beginning. Cholesterol starts to rise. Blood pressures start to rise. Changes in the body are already occurring. This is a process. It's not like you cross a finish line. Right. It's really a process. So I try to change the whole thinking dynamics of menopause. Instead of it being, okay, you're in menopause or you're not. Instead, you think of it as aging of the ovaries. Right. And that changes the way the woman really thinks about it. And then she realizes, hey, my ovaries are aging. My fertility is certainly down, I'm 45. And it all links together. And this is sort of a huge take-home mes message to my patients, is that nature made it so that the woman's body with health would be very healthy when she's reproductively functioning. So it's connected. 
It's not like reproductive functions right. exist and then everything else exists. It's all linked together and estrogen is like the hormonal glue. It's like the glue that puts together reproductive functions right. and metabolic functions. When you lose estrogen, you don't just lose reproduction, you actually go into a state of metabolic dysfunction. And so you're more likely to develop diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, all those things. So suddenly, it's like the light bulb goes on. I understand that many women, as their primary care provider, have a, a gynecologist, at, such as yourself, who can provide primary care. And that's become a role of that gynecologist. So ACOG, the organization that, that is the body of um, obstetrics and, and gynecology in this country, has a role also in educating their physicians. Um, can, you, can you speak to educating and, and how you think about it as a gynecologist? Well, years ago, they did a survey. So the survey was carried out by the American College of OBGYN, so that's ACOG, and they found that half of OBGYNs viewed themselves as primary care providers for women, that they would screen them, they wanted to care for them for their whole body, all their systems, not just their reproductive organs. Well, ACOG came out fairly recently and said, every OBGYN should be screening their women patients when they are transitioning around the menopause for cardiovascular risk. So this was really a giant step forward for healthcare for women. And the problem is it hasn't been universally adopted yet. So we need to really go out and educate the OBGYNs because it's one thing to create a mandate, you must screen, but if they don't understand how to screen and then what to do with that information, then they typically, like most humans, they won't do it right. because they don't want to be put in that position of like, I'm not sure what to do and I'm not sure what to do with this information. So ACOG did a good first step, but then you gotta take the next steps, which is educating this entire group of OBGYN so that they know how to approach women and how to open the dialogue, because it hasn't been a dialogue that many of them have actually even engaged in. How do you address in that setting evaluating them, and particularly since I'm here at Quest Diagnostics, uh, the role of lab testing? And I just a little commentary on my side is uh, we offer lipid testing, which most consumers and all doctors are aware of around LDL cholesterol. We offer advanced lipid testing, uh, but more and more, particularly to engage those um, who may have underlying cardiac disease, we're looking at markers of inflammation. And I'd like for you to ask you about how that plays in and help explain the role of inflammation and testing around that uh, in your practice. Absolutely. Well, like you said, first I have to get the buy-in, right? So I have to get the woman to recognize that, yes, she is at risk, and then she wants to find out, well, what is my risk? What is my, I know there's a potential, what is my actual risk? So I love data. So I love testing. It's non-invasive. Nobody is going to be harmed, and I get so much information. So I do want to get certain very basic things on everyone. I would definitely want to get an advanced lipid profile. So what does that mean, advanced lipid profile? So everyone thinks that there's like good cholesterol, there's bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is not actually good or bad. Cholesterol is just what it is, and it's a, the building blocks for steroid hormones, cell membranes, the right. brain. So we need to have cholesterol. And so we have particles. The cholesterol has to go around the body, and, and how's it gonna do that? Cholesterol can't just up and go wherever it wants to go. Most cholesterol in the body comes from production in the liver. And then there are these little proteins, they're called lipoproteins, right. apolipoproteins, and I call them like little bubbles. So there's different kinds of bubbles and they carry cholesterol to different places from the liver, also from the body, they get carried back to the liver for recycling or disposal. And they come in like different sizes. And so the apolipoprotein A1, sometimes called apo a1, that one is very linked to estrogen. Estrogen is very, very key to the proper production and functioning of APOA1. And it's also known as reverse cholesterol. So it's a particle that we can measure that actually is the particle that takes cholesterol and brings it back from wherever it is in the body, brings it back to the liver so that the body can get rid of it if it doesn't need it anymore. 
or recycle it mm -hmm. if it actually does need it. And so you want to have a really high level of this. I call them like the trash collectors. It just goes around and cleans up. And so you want a really high level. And estrogen helps to maintain it as a high level. But of course, as we lose our estrogen, sometimes it comes down in numbers. So I want to measure that. And then I want to follow it over time. So that's one thing. And then the apolipoprotein B, also known as ApoB. So that's the little particle or the bubble that carries cholesterol that's made in the liver to all around the body. And we need cholesterol, so it's good. And that is sometimes associated with LDL cholesterol. But we don't want overproduction because that's a sign that something's going on that's not good. So I want to measure that. So those are key parts of advanced lipid profile testing. And then you could also look at lipid particle size and other kinds of lipids too if you want to get into that so, type so of it, thing. So it sounds like before we move to the, the more of the testing area, the, the LDL cholesterol and good and bad cholesterol is an oversimplification, and particularly though in women around the issues of menopause and hormonal balance, that there's some role of more advanced lipid testing to help sort that out and help understand the real risk of the woman? Absolutely. In fact, something like 50% of people who get heart attacks have what they lab label as completely normal lipid profiles because they're not really looking at the real underlying causes of why the person had the heart attack. And so in women, uh, they're not like men, and they have very different vascular systems in the heart, and they have more microvascular disease, right. which is not picked up as well on calcium testing. When they do coronary calcium scores, they're not as predictive for women, and angiograms are not as predictive for women. So we need to look for other, other ways to actually analyze the risk for women. So big role of advanced lipid testing. And then more recently, we have seen, and I have seen, increased use of myeloperoxidase testing, which is our um, advanced uh, inflammation marker, and it's, it's measuring inflammation in the person. So help explain why that's relevant and how that plays a role. Well, it turns out that inappropriate inflammation underlies a huge host of problems that develop in the human body. We now know that, for example, um, when people have dementia, it's often due to neuroinflammation. And atherosclerosis doesn't just randomly happen. It's often due to inflammation that resides in the lining of the arteries. So inflammation is a huge problem when it's inappropriate. Inflammation, when it's appropriate, of course, saves our lives so we don't get infected and then die from some kind of infection. But when you have a trigger of chronic inflammation, and there's a whole array of things that can trigger chronic inflammation. Often now the focus is on the gut. We know that when you have the wrong microbial population in the gut, also if you have the wrong microbial population in your mouth, if you have endocrine disruptors, you know, plastics and all the chemicals that we are exposed to, heavy metals. So there's many reasons that we can have chronic inflammation. But the end result is that we have vascular dysfunction. So myeloperoxidase is a very interesting enzyme, and it actually is nature's own way, it's an enzyme, of trying to kill invaders like bacteria. The problem is when you have inappropriate chronic inflammation, which happens as people age, and in women particularly, not with aging per se, but with loss of ovarian function at any age. So if you took out an, a woman's ovaries and she's only 30 because she had severe endometriosis or ovarian cancer or some chronic uh, terrible infection or some reason, um, all of these processes will start at age 30. Mm -hmm. So it's not really aging per se, it's really loss of estrogen in right. women. That's a really a key point. So the age that you go through menopause can have an impact if it's, you know, very early, like right. younger than 45 is considered a significant increased risk factor for cardiovascular disease compared to in their 50s. So when you have this chronic inflammation, the white blood cells can inappropriately release their enzymes. And we can measure that in blood, which is amazing because it's a sign that there's inflammation ongoing in the artery lining itself. And this is 
a risk for rupture of plaque because plaque doesn't kill people. It's when it ruptures and then you get like a little scab, like a little blood clot that forms on the area of rupture. And if that little clot falls off and then it goes downstream, eventually it gets stuck right. because the vessel gets narrower and narrower and it might as well be a rock. You know, it's a blood clot. It Eventually it would and, dissolve. And causes a heart attack or a stroke. That's right. It's a block. You're blocking the flow of blood. Oxygen is not going to go. And what happens in women in particular, they this happens in small vessels. Now, so not like the main coronary arteries, but small vessels. And so only a small amount of the heart may actually be deprived of oxygen. The problem is that sets off an arrhythmia. So they're not dying because the heart is dead. They're dying because an arrhythmia is triggered. And that's what Kills. That's why they get the, the defibrillators, right? right? So, so it feels like, though, this inflammatory, measuring the inflammatory response and understanding it is very important because it, it really can lead to plaque rupture, can lead to heart attack and stroke, even in people that may not have a high cholesterol or may not have some of the other That's risk right. factors. So it can be a woman who doesn't have significant stenosis of her main coronary arteries, that she may not have a very high cholesterol, although women after menopause do tend to get much higher cholesterols, right. but not necessarily. So it's an independent risk factor related to this inflammatory state. And it's really wonderful that we can actually access this. So simply just by a blood test to actually know if this chronic inflammatory state is happening in the woman related to her vessels. And therefore, we can then take steps. And so right. we know that anyone with a very high myeloperoxidase has a real inflammatory process going on in her vascular system, and we need to get on it right away. Uh, we're talking about menopause, the risk of it in women, convincing them it's important, but some objective, tangible evidence that there's something going on in the body can be very motivating for people. And so I, that, that may yeah. be another role of this type of testing. Well, everyone wants hard data, not just me. Right. And so when you just talk in sort of philosophical terms, like, well, we know you're at higher risk, but they don't see anything, they don't feel anything. And in general, know, women are at risk, but we have no specific evidence in you that this right. may make it a much more personal. And, and, and we know that many people walk around and have their first heart attack, especially women, and their first heart attack is their fatal heart attack, and they felt fine the day before. But I enjoy being more proactive. That's one of the reasons I went into obstetrics in the beginning is because I said, what could be happier than bringing new life into the world? I want to make a dent. I want to make a difference in preventing heart attacks, in preventing heart failure, in, in preventing strokes. And that means I have to work with women before the worst things have already happened. So this is our opportunity to recognize risk, take proper steps and educate our patients on what they can do. And it's not that complicated, you know, it's not rocket science, not so what they can do, even taking small steps to change the, the future so that they don't get that heart attack or stroke, so that they can live with an optimal right. health and happiness, right? So that they can do that. And that's my mission. And, you know, having tools to work with, like proper lab testing, really makes my job so much easier. Well, that illustrates about everything we've talked about today at some level. And I really appreciate the discussion. It's been wonderful. And hopefully our conversation helps uh, patients, women, um, physicians, and, and other folks out there that can make a difference the way you are. Well, that's our goal and our mission and hopefully mission accomplished. All right. Thank you.